Nehemiah. It's where we've been in the last few weeks, and when you hear his name, uh, you might think of several things, but you should think, indeed, cupbearer. Cupbearer of the king Artaxerxes, 900 miles away from the homeland, Israel, he goes there and he becomes a wall builder. Uh, Leads his people to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem in 52 days. But from there, he becomes not just a wall builder, but eventually a governor. Matter of fact, when you hear the name Nehemiah, you should hear this, the Lord has comforted. That's what his name means. It means comforter. And when you think about Nehemiah, what I want you to realize is that he is a type of the ultimate comforter. Matter of fact, today, the whole message is entitled, The Lord Has Comforted. And as we dive into Nehemiah chapter 5, what I want you to see are all the ways that the Lord works through Nehemiah to bring comfort to his people, but also the ways that the Lord uses his son Jesus to bring comfort to To us. And so today, if you have your Bibles, I want you to just turn with me to Nehemiah chapter 5. If you don't have a Bible, we would love to bless you with one today before you leave our campus. Uh, We would love for you to go by connection uh, point, which is out these double doors to my my right, your left, and uh, they would love to hook you up with a Bible so that you have to read on a daily basis and uh, where you can grow in your relationship to Christ and abide in His Word every day. We would love for you to have a part in that. Now, here's the deal. The things that we've learned so far about Nehemiah is that he says, hey, let us rise up and build. And the people had mind to do that. They worked. But here's the deal. When you uh, say, hey, let us rise up, we know that there's also an enemy who says, let me rise up. And so he has been uh, facing opposition all this time. Uh, and here's what I would just say is that you never, you never get to the, to the point where you receive a crown until you've actually bore the cross. And that's true for Nehemiah. In order for you to, to hear those words, well done, thy good and faithful servant, it is going to require you and I to give ourselves up in many ways. To be sacrificial, to experience oppression in some ways. Because that's what the biblical mandate is in Scripture. But when you get to the point where we are in Nehemiah chapter 5, he has faced opposition. The people had mind to work. They have been praying the whole time that God would do amazing things uh, and help them in their opposition. And they just kept going back to the work. But what's interesting is, is that they have had opposition from without, but they also, you see, have opposition within. And in Nehemiah chapter 5, you're going to see some of the oppression, opposition, that seems to happen before the 52 days is completed of them building the wall. It's as if they have to hit pause and address a couple of issues within their own midst. In some ways, Nehemiah is going to have a family meeting with his people. In Nehemiah chapter 5, you see what's happening. It says this in verse 1. Now there arose a great outcry of the people and of their wives against their Jewish brothers. So there's an outcry. Uh, When I hear the words outcry, I'm almost reminded in a lot of ways in Exodus, when the people were enslaved in Israel, the Israelites were enslaved in Egypt, and you can remember God heard their cries. In some ways, that's what the people were doing. They are outcrying, and they are in some ways grumbling and complaining about what is happening to them. And Nehemiah happens to hear this. And then he's going he's gonna to show us that there's three groups of people who are in some ways complaining or have something to say as they cry out for help. In verse 2 it says, There were those who said, With our sons and our daughters we are many, so let us get grain that we may eat and keep alive. In verse 2 he's just showing you that there are those that they can't, afford to get grain and wine. Like there's, there's not enough food on their table. And so they are crying out. There's, there's not enough food to feed our children. There's not enough grain that abounds in the land. There's, there's no way for us to get our, our hands on it. And so in some ways they say we lack the nourishment that's needed in our family. In verse 3, you see another group. It says, There were also those who said, We are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our houses to get grain because of the famine. So there are others that they're having to give up their possessions in order to put food on the table. And they say, We're running out of resources. 
So group one says, we don't have enough food on the table. Group two says, we're having to give up our possessions in order to have the resources, but we're out of resources. We're tapped out. We got nothing else to sell. There's nothing else for us to do in order to get the resources that are needed for us to provide for our family. And then you have group, group three. Look at verse four. And it says, and then there were those who said, and we have borrowed money for the king's taxes on our fields and our vineyards. There's another group that they have gotten themselves into debt. And they don't have a way out because they have, they have acquired more debt and more burden in paying back the king's tax than they can afford. And so here it is. You've got these Israelites, and they are struggling. They are struggling in a multitude of ways. They're struggling, one, to put food on the table. Struggling, two, to have the resources that are needed to find a way to climb out of the hole they're in. And number three, there's many of them who have taken on burdens and these debts, and they cannot find a way out. And so you see all these reasons. And you might wonder, well, is it just that they're just foolish in what they've done? And I would presume that you could make the case that many of them have been foolish. But you also see extenuating circumstances, right? Look at in verse 3, it says that there were a famine. Verse 4, there was the king's taxes. Verse 5, there is oppression. And that oppression is coming from within. What is interesting to note is that in verse 1, many of the outcries are against their Jewish brothers. The hardship, the challenges that they are facing are happening within their own people. And it's something that they have the opportunity to relieve in some ways, but they're choosing not to. And so you've got, one, this group of people who are not helping one another the way that they possibly should. And then you have these extenuating circumstances as well. Now, I know that we probably don't understand extenuating circumstances, right? Like COVID, inflation, lots of things that are out of our control, right? But that's what was happening in this day and time. There were things that were outside of their control. And they had hardships and they had calamities and they were complaining and outcrying to their leader, Nehemiah, because of the oppression that had been put on them regarding all of these extenuating circumstances. In verse 5, it says, Now our flesh is as flesh of our brothers, our children are as their children. Yet we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves. And some of our daughters have already been enslaved. But it is not if our power, it's not as if it's in our power to help it. For other men have our fields and our vineyards. What's interesting about this is that the conditions that they are facing, many of them are, are, being, are being forced within. In verse 5, what you need to see is they have the same country, and you would think that the same country has the same goals. Now, have you ever lived in a country where it's Difficult to know if you have the same goals. That's what's happening here. You would think, well, you would think that they would be all of one mind. They would be Jewish people and that they would all not only be of one mind to rebuild the wall, but they'd be of one mind to take care of one another. But that's not what's happening. Matter of fact, what is being shared with Nehemiah is that, hey, we're forcing our sons and daughters to go into slavery in order to put food on our table, in order to remove the debts that we have of the king's taxes. And so what they're doing is, is they are trading their children to other people in order to, to take care of the responsibilities of putting food on the table. Now, see, we, would not, we might go, well, you know what, I'm going to get a second job, or I'm going to cut back a little bit. But what they're doing is they're actually sharing the burden by giving away their children as slaves. And Nehemiah is here. And if you remember who Nehemiah is, he is the one who was the cupbearer who became the wall builder who now is becoming the governor. And if you remember what his purpose is, he is the one who is the comforter. He's had enough of it. Matter of fact, look at his response. In Nehemiah chapter 5, verse 6, he says... I was very angry when I heard their outcry and these words. And here's why. It's because Nehemiah had a purpose. And here's what Nehemiah's purpose was. It was he was to come to make peace. Nehemiah was to come and make peace. Let me put that for you up on the screen. Nehemiah was to come to make peace. 
to make peace. And, and when you think about making peace, it meant that he had to become angry about these things. What was he angry about? Verse 6. He was angry about the oppression. He was angry about the slavery. He was angry about the way that they were handling all of these things. And when he heard these words, it says in verse 7 that he took counsel, he says, with myself. Now, I love that. I, I love that. I took counsel with myself. Now, I always like to take counsel with others, but I love the fact that he was like, listen, I'm a prayed up man. God has given me a purpose. I left as a cupbearer to a wall builder. Now I'm the governor of the people, and I took counsel with myself. I got I imply there that he, he goes, I prayed. I think it's another opportunity where you see he seeks after his God to know how to help oppressed people. And then he says this, verse 7, And then I brought charges against the nobles and the officials. So after he takes counsel, he goes, Listen, I've come for a purpose, and my purpose is to bring peace in the midst of all this chaos, to do something about the challenges that we have. Now, here's what's interesting. When I say he came to make peace, I think it's very interesting to note that the word peace in the Old Testament is the word shalom. Now, you and I think shalom is a greeting. Like, it's just something that Jewish people say when they're greeting one another. Hey, shalom. And it's, it, it's as if you're saying, hello, peace. But what's important to know is that that word peace there, shalom, does not mean merely a greeting. It also does not mean it's an absence of conflict. Because what we think is that there's peace in our family when there's no fighting. That's not the, that's not the case. The word peace actually means to make complete. It's the idea of restoration. Matter of fact, listen to me, lean in with me. The idea of shalom is when you have a wall that's broken down and piece by piece it's put back together. When the wall is put back together, there is peace. It's the idea of completeness. And so when a Jewish person says shalom and they mean peace, it literally means we're complete. We have all we need. Peace to you. Shalom. It means that we are restored. And so when Nehemiah comes to make peace, he is saying, I am a wall builder. And not only am I a wall builder, but I'm coming as a governor to restore order and completeness. Now listen, Israel's problem was not merely that they had broken down walls. Israel's problem was that they also had conflict and war within. They weren't taking care of people. They weren't taking care of the ones that they were called to. And they knew better because even the Mosaic law it very clearly, very clearly stated that they were not to treat one another the way they were. And so in many ways, they weren't a complete people. They, they weren't honoring God and his, his law. He, they, they weren't honoring one another. And there was chaos in the land. And so not only is he helping rebuild the wall, he's also helping establish a new way of living. And so this is what he says to those that he takes counsel with and that he takes up these challenges with. In verse 7, the latter part of it, he says, And then I said to them, he says, You are exacting interest, each from his brother. And I had a great assembly against them. And then I said to them, We, as far as we are able, have have bought back our Jewish brothers who have been sold to the nations. But even you sell your brothers that they may be sold to us. Now, what Nehemiah is implying is he goes, there's been a point where we've already gone around and we've already bought back some of our brother's property. Now, we can just imply that, he is our, that they have been doing that over the course of time. They were buying it from some Persian people and perhaps they were paying back. and Whatever they've done, they've already bought back some Jewish people. And what he's saying is, not only are we going around and we're buying back possessions and land and we're getting children back and we're getting animals back and we're getting land and possessions back, but he goes, then we get it back only for you to take it. He goes, that's craziness. We're spending money to get things back for our people only for you to take it from your own people. He goes, that's not making peace. That's not the shalom peace of God that we know. That's not who we are. And so he says, look, we're buying back only for it to be sold to you. Isn't that convenient? And then listen what it says in the latter part of verse 8. I love this. 
They were silent, and they could not find a word to say. You ever have a, uh, an argument with someone, and you kind of got them, and they're in the corner, and, and they really have nothing to say? And you know why they have nothing to say? Is because they know they're wrong. Now, I would say that that happens to me occasionally. And I would say it's probably with my wife, where she's got me, I'm like, I know, I'm an idiot, and I, I'm wrong. It happens, right? Any of it ever happened to you? It's the first time we get an amen today. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> amen. I agree, brother. Yes. That, that's why he, he's got them. And they know it. They know that what they've done is wrong. It breaks God's Mosaic law. It breaks the heart of God as people of peace. And it's not a representation of what Israel was to be to the nations. And they knew it. Although they had not known what it looked like to be Israel in all the days they were together. But here it is. The one who the Lord sent as a comforter, Nehemiah, was there to make things right. And here's why. Because not only did he come to bring peace, he also came to end oppression. He came to end oppression. He came to fix a lot of the brokenness that was happening in their society. Matter of fact, if you look at verse 9, he said, So I said, the thing that you are doing is not good. Ought you not to walk in the fear of our God to prevent the taunts of the nations, of the nations, our enemies? Moreover, I and my brothers and my servants are lending them money and grain. Let us abandon this exacting of interest. Return to them this very day their fields, their vineyards, their olive orchards, their houses, the percentage of the money, grain, wine, and oil that you have been exacting from them. In essence, he says, listen, today it ends. Whatever they've been paying you, they're not going to pay you anymore. Whatever fields you have of theirs, you're going to return it. This oppression is ending. We did not go and buy back from the nations, our people, merely for you to take advantage of them. And so whatever you're getting of them, you need to go ahead and transfer it from your banking account back to theirs. Because this is over. This oppression, this, this way of thinking is being done, it's done with. And so he just encourages them to return. Verse 12 says, Then they said, We will restore these things and require nothing from them. We will do as you say. Now, I don't know about you, but this man must have been an incredible leader. To get a group of people in a nation who has been ex exacting interest on others and taking advantage of others, to get them to do as they, they said they would do is a really encouraging thing for me. Because as leaders, and you know, whether it be in your business or whether it be in the place that you lead, getting people to do what they say they'll do can be a challenge, right? But nonetheless, they agree, we will do as you say. And then Nehemiah says, verse 12, the latter part of it, he says, And I called the priest, and I made them swear to do as they had promised. I also shook out the fold of my garment, and I said, So may God shake out every man from his house and from his labor who does not keep this promise. So may he be shaken out and emptied. And the assembly said, Amen, and they praised the Lord, and they did as they promised. So as he shakes out his garment, he goes, may it be to you as I have done to my garment. If you don't keep your word, may the Lord take you and may he shake you out. And may he expose you for who you are and what you've done before the nation. And yet they moved to agree to do what they said. And here's why. Because Nehemiah didn't merely come to make peace and end oppression. Nehemiah also came to rule judiciously. He came to rule with order, with with fairness. He came to do what's right. Matter of fact, if you continue on in verse 14, he says, Moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the 20th year to the 32nd year of Artaxerxes the king, that's 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the food allowance of the governor. The former governors who were before me, they laid heavy burdens on the people and they took from their daily ration 40 shekels of silver. He basically says, listen, for the 12 years that I ruled, he goes, I didn't take all that the governor could have taken. Now, could you all imagine living in a land where people didn't take from the people more than they should take from the people? We probably don't understand that either, do we? But he says, that's what was happening. 
And he says, and we did not do that. We did not. Me nor my brothers did we take the governor's allowance. He goes, the former guys, they did it. They laid heavy burdens on the people. Because isn't it easy oftentimes to get higher up in power and the higher up you go, the easier it is to fall susceptible to taking advantage of the people? And that's what was happening. And I'm sure that in some ways, if you think about people's motives, that's not how it begins. I, oftentimes, I think people can begin to serve the people with pure motives. But isn't it crazy that over time, if not careful, you'll lose your way? And it seems to have been what happened. But Nehemiah says, look, I'm not losing my way. And not only me, nor will my men. Verse 15, the latter part of it says, Even their servants lorded over the people, but I did not do so because of the fear of my God. So what kept him from doing it? He goes, I'm responsible to God. And so isn't that enough for you to do what's right? Isn't that enough to do what is right in Nehemiah's eye? He goes, look, because I ultimately going to get, give an account to God. Verse 16, he says, I also per- persevered in the work on the wall. As we acquired no land and all my servants were gathered for this work. He didn't focus on personal gain all this. He never bought a piece of land for himself. Verse 17, moreover, there were at my table 150 men. Jews and officials besides those who came to us from the nations that were around us. Now what was prepared at my expense for each day was one ox and six six choice sheep and birds and every ten days all kinds of wine in abundance. Yet for all this I did not demand the food allowance of the governor because the service was too heavy on the people. Therefore, look at verse 19. He said, remember for my good, O my God, all that I have done for this people. He goes, I could have demanded more, but I didn't. Do you know why he didn't demand more? Because his name meant the Lord is comforted. Nehemiah couldn't come and make peace. He couldn't come to end depression. And he couldn't come to rule judiciously if he was going to take advantage of people. And friends, that is what we're looking for in leaders. That's what you should be looking for In leaders, that's the leader you should be seeking to be. A person who makes peace. A person who ends oppression around you. A person who rules fairly, judiciously. It doesn't mean that you don't make hard calls. It doesn't mean that there's not consequences to people's decisions. But it means that you're going to do what is right. You're going to do what's fair. And you're going to be a person who is known to be a person of integrity. That's who Nehemiah was. And here's why. Do you know why Nehemiah was this? Not merely because he was a wall builder. Not merely because he was the king's cupbearer. Not merely because he was the one who comes to be a governor. He is the type of Christ. He is a foreshadowing. 400 plus years before Jesus ever came. He is a foreshadowing of the Christ. Matter of fact, if you've been with us the last few weeks, you've heard about who he is. I'm going to show you real quickly who he is. And I want you to show more than anything. And I I encourage you to pay attention these next handful of minutes. I want you to to see who Nehemiah is really pointing to. Because Nehemiah is not pointing to himself. Nehemiah is, he's pointing to the real peacemaker. To the real cupbearer. To the real wall builder. And to the one who really comes to govern fairly and rightly and judiciously. Matter of fact, you remember Nehemiah, a cup, a, a cup bearer? He was a cup bearer to king. You see that in Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 11. Let me show you the real cup bearer. Look at this in Luke chapter 22, verses 41 through 42. You might remember the words of this man. And he withdrew from about a stone's throw away. And he knelt down and he prayed. And he said, Father... If you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Do you know who came to bear the cup of wrath? His name was Jesus. And Nehemiah is simply a foreshadowing of things to come. He is helping the Jewish people recognize that, hey, in your oppression, in your hardship, in all of the opposition that you face, there is one who one day will come to destroy all those things. Matter of fact, remember what Jesus said in John chapter 16, verse 33? In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. Why, friends? Because I have overcome the world. He is the cupbearer. He came to drink the wrath of God and sin on your behalf. Wow. He wasn't just a cupbearer. Remember Nehemiah? Nehemiah, He also, when he heard the oppression of his people, what did he do? He wept. He wept over his people. In Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 11, you see that. 
But guess what? Jesus did the same. In Luke chapter 19, verses 41, it says this, And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it. Verse 42, saying, What, what that you, even you, had known on this day, the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Th- that, is, that is the time where Jesus is very clearly seeing a people that has rejected the message of the gospel, and he weeps for Jerusalem. He weeps for Israel. Why does he weep for them? Because they have, they have missed the fact that there is a cupbearer who's bringing peace. So just as Nehemiah came to establish that principle, Jesus did too. Matter of fact, you remember Nehemiah? He left Artaxerxes 900 miles away, and he got proximate to his people. You remember that? Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 6 through 10, you see how close he gets to his people. Well, let me show you in Philippians chapter 2, verses 4 through 8, the one who gets proximate to his people. Matter of fact, Paul says this to the church of Philippi in Philippians chapter 2, verse 4. He says this, Let each of you not look to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. And then he says this, Have your, this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, He did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Now in Philippians 2, Paul is saying there is one who humbled himself, that he, being in the form of God, he was God in the heavens and always has been God from the beginning to the end. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He was before time and he's he's going to be here when our time, as we know it, comes to an end. But he, being in all that he was in God, submitted himself to the Father so that he would come and identify with us. He was tempted, as Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 says, in every way just as we are, yet he was without sin. He came to be all that God desires for us to be, and he got proximate to his people. What type of humility does it take for you to leave the heavenly abodes to come and identify with sinful men? That's what he did. Nehemiah was just a picture of what Christ would be. And what did Nehemiah do? He came and he restored broken down walls, right? Hostility, oppression, all of those things. And so that's what I would just show you. Nehemiah comes to restore broken down walls and he restores peace. I'll put it for you up on the screen so you can write that down. He restores broken down walls and he restores peace. And you see that in Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 15, that one day they're going to do that. Well, guess what? Jesus does very similarly, restores peace and repairs broken walls. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 13 through 14. This is amazing. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace. Who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. The walls that were in disrepair have been repaired because of Christ and his sacrifice and his blood sacrifice. You and I can now be one with God. But what's interesting is, is he doesn't stop there. He didn't just repair the broken down walls of hostility between us and God and our sinfulness. He doesn't just restore peace through the blood of Christ. But he also, he removes oppression and debt. You remember what Nehemiah does in removing oppression and debt? Well, look what Colossians chapter 2 goes on and says. Verse 13 and 14, you see this in Colossians 2. It says, And you were dead in your trespasses, and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. And he canceled the uh, the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. The oppression and the debt that we owed because of sin, Christ canceled and nailed to the cross. Nehemiah would eventually triumph over his enemies, friends. He would eventually look them in the face and he would win. Sanballat and Tobiah would have no words. And here it is. I want you to see, friends, is that Jesus does the same. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 15, after he removes the legal demands of sin, I want you to see what it says. He disarmed the rulers and the authorities and he put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Christ 
triumphs over his enemies. Satan has no more word. Why? Because all that he has accomplished. And then what's interesting is, is that after Nehemiah had comforted his people, do you know what he did? After 12 years of being the governor, he returned to Artaxerxes for a short time. Where is our Lord right now? He is with the Father for a short time. Matter of fact, you can see it in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our forefathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God. He's the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. And after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. After Jesus had come to fulfill all his purposes, to make peace, to end oppression of sin, to meet the legal demands of God, to govern rightly and judiciously, he returns and he ultimately preparing to for a kingdom that will last forever, where there will be no broken down walls, where there will be no conflict and opposition, where there will be peace with man and God because sin has been atoned for appropriately. Which then begs the question, if that is what Jesus has done, then what is it that you and I are to do? See, over the last 14 days, I've been praying every day at 5.20 p.m. And my prayer every single day is that I would be God's ambassador. And then I've been praying that you too would be God's ambassador. That when that alarm goes off, and I'm thankful for alarms, that, that I know that there are dozens, if not hundreds of people that are praying with me that we would be God's people and that he would make his appeal to us and through us. And that's what I'm praying. Matter of fact, that's why... I want you to see what 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 20 says. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, friends, if that's you and that's me, if we're in Christ, it says this, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. That means I am not the same person, and that also means I'm no longer in charge of my own life. He goes, all of this is from God. What the old's passed away, the new has come, and all that's from God. Why is that from God? Who through, look at it, Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So why does he, why does he redeem us? Simply so we can go to heaven and be with him? Friends, if that's all that there was, then he would have already taken you and I. But he doesn't merely change our lives just for the sake that we have heaven. But that's how we appro- appropriately present it in our culture. Hey, as little children come, and obviously in their innocence, isn't it easy for us just to say, hey, Jesus wants to, Jesus wants to take your sin, and he wants to give you a new life. But what we fail to teach our children, and what we fail to live, is the reason that Jesus is forgiving us is not merely to give us a heavenly abode, because if he wanted that, he would take us right away. But it is merely to also make us, what, ministers of reconciliation. It is to make us ambassadors, that God is going to make his appeal through us. Matter of fact, let's put verse 18 back up there just so we can see it. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. My question would be this, are you a minister of reconciliation? In whose life have you brought peace? In whose life have you sought to end oppression? In whose life have you blessed to help them with broken down walls of sin and anger and drug addiction and oppression and life choices? Verse 19 goes on and just says this. And that is that in Christ God, he was reconciling the world to himself and he was not counting what? Their trespasses against, trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ, for Christ. And God is making his appeal through us. And so we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. In essence, he's saying, listen, if you have experienced the peace and the joy and the loving kindness of our Savior, he says, why would you not desire to give that to others? Why would you not desire to be a minister of reconciliation? And friends, here's what I'm encouraging you to hear. And listen, we are not merely gathering today in whatever location we are, whether it's online or here presently, merely for the sake of gathering. 
we are gathering to remind ourselves who we are and what our responsibility is. And friends, I'm going to say something, and it may prick your heart, and it may be a little bit offensive, and I just want you to hear my heart. We have been better together over the last few weeks. And the reason we did that was for alignment and purpose and clarity. But it wasn't to give you a taste of what could be. It was not to give you a taste of, hey, what if we all came together and we just did this from here on? No, because we have a greater purpose. This life is not about your comfort or my comfort. It's not about how many we can gather in a a room so that we can encourage one another forever. It's for a short time to remind one another that God is at work. And that he is doing a wonderful thing. And that there are more people that are out in our county that can fill our rooms. And so if we think our place is empty, then let's go tell people about Jesus. When's the last time you invited someone? When's the last time that you did something for someone in need? Listen, I think what happens over the course of time is we get so comfortable and we just go to church that we forget that we are the church. We are his ambassadors. He has no other plan on earth to reconcile sinful man to himself but through you. Do I believe that God can perform dreams and visions? Yes, I can. I do not believe that's normative. You know what I believe is normative? I believe what's normative is that a person who was once lost and is now found goes and tells a brother who is lost about the love of Jesus. That's normative. That is God's plan on earth. His plan to reconcile sinful man is you, is me. And that just begs the question, when's the last time that you shared the gospel with someone? When's the last time that you met a physical need? When's the last time that sacrificially you gave of yourself in a way that actually would have brought a little bit of famine to your table so that others had something? When's the last time that you felt what your neighbors feel. Yes, I'm talking about the crazy neighbors that you want to avoid. When's the last time that you felt what they felt? When's the last time that you shared in their pain? When's the last time that you did something to in some ways make a difference for the cause of Christ as an ambassador? See, Nehemiah's name was the Lord has comforted. And friends, I would tell you that if there was a name that the Lord would wish to give you, it would be that. A people that the Lord uses to bring comfort. To bring hope. And friends, I just want you to hear more than anything. Listen, I, I want to be a church that makes a radical difference in our county. If not careful, I can lose sight of what that looks like in my life. If not careful, I, I don't become a comforter, I become the comforted. Anybody guilty of that? But listen, I need you to remind me from time to time what it is that our goal is. But I also need to remind you that, if, hey, if we like full rooms where people sing, then we have to invite people to be a part of what God has for them. And we have to remember that the reason we have two locations is because there's two communities in need. And we need to know that if God ever desires for us to do more, it's just because there's a greater need. But one of the things I don't want to do is be a comforted people. I pray that the Lord would put every opposition in our path as much as possible if that's what causes growth among us. And we have faced opposition. We've had it from without, and we've had it from within. We have had difficult times. The last 12 years of our journey has not always been easy. But what I will tell you is this, is the Lord has called us to continue to be faithful ambassadors for his cause. And I pray that you'll join me in that. Now, to help you kind of get going and what it looks like to bless your neighbors and to be a part of your city, I'm going I'm to motivate you a bit, Okay. 
Lord willing, you got an envelope when you came in. If you got one, go ahead and grab it. In just a few moments, we're going to open these envelopes together. Before we do, I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. This envelope, which says better together on it, is just a reminder to you that as you open it, that we are truly better together, that it takes all of us. Now, I want you to hear something real quickly. What you're about to open is is a monetary value that every kindergartner and up will receive today. And the, the, it can range from our younger levels, 5 to 10, 15, 20 bucks for them. But in this room, it's going to be anywhere from 20 to 50 to 100 to $200. And what I'm telling you is, is that we're not giving a small amount of resources away. We are giving a very significant chunk of our resources away. Also, we'll tell you that at this point in time right now, we're behind budget. We're not meeting our budget monthly. So in a lot of ways, you could say, well, that doesn't make sense. And I would tell you, it doesn't make sense. But at the end of the day, the resources that we have are not ours in the first place. And the reality is, is if we're going to use them for something, why not use them for the good of people around us? And, and here's the deal. I don't, I, I'm not trying to motivate you today to, to give, although that, that is something that you need to know. When you give, you, we are meeting needs. I cannot tell you the number of people every single year who come to us that go to other churches that are not having their needs, their needs met within their own local church. And we begin the conversation every single time. Hey, have you, st- have you spoken to anybody in your church? Yes, my church can't help me. And so you just need to know that in Van Zant County, the church they know to come to is Stone Point Church. We don't ask a ton of questions. We don't require a whole lot. And the reason why is because I, I think about the value of my time and the money that uh, our staff makes. And I can't, I can't fathom, for me, um, why we would spend a couple hours interviewing person that you would spend more time paying me to interview them than just to give them what they need to go take care of their resources. So I'm not an incredibly intelligent person, but I just think about our cost of return on our investment. You can pay me to interview people, or we can just actually give them the money that they need. And then you go, well, well here's the deal. I don't know what they're going to do with it. And you're right. I don't know what they're going to do with it. But I'm not responsible for what they do with it. I'm responsible to be God's hands and feet. Now, the reason I give you that, this, and our staff and our elders are giving you this, is because we want you to be a tangible example of God's hands and feet. Now, as you open this, there are a couple of things. There's a few restrictions. One, you cannot give it back to us. Listen, you do what you want, but I'm saying to you, our elders believe firmly that if you put this back in our offering box, you are being disobedient to a holy God who has placed whatever it is in your hands for a reason. So you, if you want to take up opposition with him, then you can. That's up to you. But for us, we're entrusting it to you as a resource, not because it makes sense, but because God in his sovereignty gave you an envelope this morning. And it is for you to use with wisdom. <laughs> But you can't give it back to us. So we should not find any in our offering box. Two, this is to meet a need as you have eyes to see and ears to hear. See, that was what's so incredible about the people that Nehemiah was leading. They had eyes to see and ears to hear. That's what we're asking of you. Look for a place where a wall is broken down, where there's a breach in the city, and fill the need. Now, there's a multitude of ways you can do that. You can have a great conversation with a waiter or waitress, even this afternoon. You can get to know their name. Even as you circle up to pray before you eat, you just say, Hey, um, Sarah, do you mind if I pray? You got any prayer, prayer needs? Hey, Sarah, can, I, can we pray for you real quick? You want to join us in prayer? She may say no. She may say yes. She may share. She may not. But the reality is you got to know her name and you asked if there was a need. Then pray for her. At the very end, something I like to do is just go, Hey, Sarah, do you, how, how great do you think your service was today? I mean, it was, it was good. Well, hey, do you think you're worth like 20%? Oh, I don't know. I had this conversation just this week with a waitress. Oh, I don't know. I hate to answer those questions. And I would say, hey, I would tell you, I don't think 20, 20% does the justice of how you served us today. Oh, okay. Whew, sweating, you know, bullets. 
and then you leave something generous. Far more generous than 15 or 18 or 20 percent. That's a great way. I would say that our kids and students are preparing to go to camp soon. Um, Many of them are signing up even as maybe there's a need. Maybe you know there's a family, and, and maybe you know that your contribution would change a kid's life and potentially even their eternity by helping a kid go to student camp or kids camp. A great way to use that resource. Potentially, maybe you're at Walmart and you like to do something random. You see a single mom or what you presume to be a single mom or somebody is struggling, and you just go, they just, just eyes to see, ears to hear. You're just watching, and you just go, hey, I'm going to buy their groceries, and maybe that helps. Maybe it's a neighbor who has a need and you know that there's a need to, for a new front door. Potentially they're behind in rent a little bit. Hey, what a great way to, to bless them. Now, there's a variety of places that you can use this, right? But let me tell you, there's, there may be one more. Maybe you're the person in need. Maybe you're the one who goes, you know what, I, I'm struggling. And maybe you've been praying to God recently to help you with rent or with something that you absolutely need. Listen, from our elders and the generous people of stone point church we would say keep it keep it why in the world would we want you to go help needs of oppressed people if you right now are in a time of oppression like inflation's just got you gas is more expensive although it's starting to come down but you're like it's way more expensive as i can't even afford to go to work listen use it for yourself this money is to be used in a way that God impressed upon your heart. But listen, I want you to hear this. Listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. Do not feel guilty for a moment if you need this. And more than that, do not believe that you're more spiritual if you don't keep it when there's a need. Because that's not spiritual, that's foolish. Let me say that one more time. It is foolish to take a resource that God has put in your hand and give it away if you need it. And so it is there for you to use wisely. And I don't know what the need is. I don't know what the needs will be. But what I will say is this, is that God has entrusted all of us a resource to use. Now here's one other thing I'm going to ask. And it's only for those in the room that could do it. I'm going to ask that you would prayerfully consider taking whatever it is that you get in your pocket and doubling it. Instead of, th- instead of thousands upon thousands upon thousands, it'll be thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands of dollars. It will make a significant dent and needs around our county in a way that is to the glory of God and the good of many people. And I pray you'll join me in that. But real quickly, what I would love for you to do is just open that envelope and see what the Lord has entrusted to your care. Now, as you see what he's entrusted to your care, here's what I would say. Go be a tangible expression of God's love and a comforter of people. And let me pray as we close our time together that God would use all of this as his resource for the glory of God around the world. Starting right here in our own home. And So may God use this. Let's pray together. Father, you know what every single person has received. You know what others in our county need. And Lord, I pray in this moment that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and wisdom to know where to use these resources. Lord, I pray that as a people we would realize that even though it doesn't make sense sometimes to do these things, I pray that we would walk by faith and not by sight. Lord, I would pray in this moment that you would remind us that the resources we have are not ours. And if you own the cattle on a thousand hills, then the resources we're giving today are in minimal and what could seem like an insignificant amount. But Lord, we trust that just as you can multiply fishes and loaves, 
you can take and use these resources exponentially more than we could ask or imagine. And we pray that you would do that. More than anything, I pray that we would steward them well. And I pray that we would just be reminded of the parable of talents. There's some of us that we have the inclination just to go and take this money and just bury it. Lord, may we not do that. May we invest it in things that will outlive us. And may we tell stories over the next handful of weeks to each other how people have been encouraged. Father, we love you and we praise you and we thank you for your glory and our good and for the generosity that you displayed through your son, Jesus Christ, and the example that you gave us through Nehemiah. May we be like Nehemiah. May we be like the Christ. May we be your ambassadors, and may you make your appeal to the world through us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.